The act has the potential to become one of the great civil rights laws of our generation. Prior to the 1990s, people with disabilities were treated as second-class citizens and were looked down upon by society. Based on earlier civil rights legislation, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA for short, was passed in 1990 and put an end to discriminatory and societal barriers that prevented people with disabilities from fully integrating into their communities. While the ADA has transformed the societal landscape and ensured the rights of people living with disabilities, there still remain significant barriers to realizing their full equality. Historically, societies have frequently misconstrued, overreacted to, or ignored differences in individual mental and physical abilities. In colonial times, it was considered the family's responsibility to care for individuals born with disabilities or those who later became disabled through illness, injury, or other causes. Until the 1800s, a system of farming out individuals with disabilities existed. Public concern over abuses, including recorded cases in which care providers collected their fees and then locked people with disabilities in attics to starve or freeze to death, eventually led to a different approach. A shift towards more organized, institutionalized care began in the 1820s. The term warehousing was used to describe this type of treatment. The protective isolation model of disabled institutions operated on the assumption that people with disabilities needed protection from the hardships of society. As a result, many individuals who could have contributed to society and lived productively had been isolated and segregated. Systemic, inhumane discrimination against those with disabilities continued to be prevalent across the nation due to a lack of regulations and legislation protecting the rights of these individuals. However, following the end of World War II, returning veterans who had been severely injured during combat and were now disabled were seen as war heroes. This shifted mindset enabled society to realize that people with disabilities had been sidelined for too long and that they too were deserving of equal rights. In 1971, a New York judge described people with disabilities as the most discriminated against minority in our nation. In public schools, large numbers of children with disabilities were systematically excluded. According to widely quoted estimates, in the 1970s, roughly 1 million school-aged children with disabilities were completely excluded from public educational programs, and another 3 million students with disabilities attended public schools but services needed to meet their basic educational needs were not provided for. Thus, over half of all kids with disabilities were not receiving a minimally adequate education. Furthermore, state residential treatment institutions for people with disabilities were generally in poor condition. Large state facilities, typically located in rural areas with high walls and locked wards that isolated the residents from the rest of society, were abysmal and often unsanitary, dangerous, overcrowded, and inhumane. In 1972, a New York court described the conditions at Willowbrook State School, a state-supported institution for children with intellectual disabilities, as horrible, dreadful, subhuman, and not only appalling, but frightful. In response to the inhumane and primitive conditions of these facilities, people with disabilities began to challenge societal barriers that excluded them from their communities. Parents of children with disabilities began to fight against the exclusion and segregation of their children. Local groups began to advocate for the rights of people with disabilities and challenged the notion that people with disabilities needed to be institutionalized. The modern disability rights movement was influenced by the goals, rhetoric, and tactics of the civil rights movement, and over the years, there has been an increasing prominence of people with disabilities as its leaders. The breakage of the societal barrier faced by many people with disabilities was not instantaneous. Prior to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was passed to provide equal access for people with disabilities by removing architectural, employment, and transportation barriers. Section 501 and 503 of the law prohibits federal agencies from discriminating against individuals with disabilities. The most monumental and significant part of the act, however, was Section 504 which requires federal entities to make reasonable accommodations for qualified individuals with disabilities. Section 504 was based on the 1964 Civil Rights Act and mandated integration of people with disabilities into mainstream institutions. For the first time, people with disabilities were viewed as a class, 
a minority group subject to discrimination and deserving of basic civil rights protections. Senator Hubert Humphrey, who had attempted in earlier years to pass civil rights legislation covering people with disabilities, said after the passing of the act that the time has come to firmly establish the right of disabled Americans to dignity and self-respect as equal and contributing members of society, and to end the virtual isolation of millions of children and adults. In order for the law to become effective, regulations had to be issued defining who was a disabled person and what constituted discrimination and non-discrimination in the context of disability. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, or HEW for short, had been given the task of publicizing regulations to implement Section 504, which would serve as guidelines for all other federal agencies. However, HEW delayed signing the 504 regulations for four years as many business and government leaders remained hesitant about implementing Section 504. During this time, the disabilities movement grew in sophistication, skill, and visibility. On April 5, 1977, in cities across the United States, individuals who were deaf, blind, using wheelchairs, living with mental disabilities, or living with paraplasia and quadriplasia all assembled for the same reason to picket the regional offices of the HEW. Their main goal was to put pressure on the newly appointed head of HEW, Joseph Califano, to sign and implement guidelines specific to Section 504, which would further inform other agencies including the Department of Transportation and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. All over the country, people with disabilities sat in at HEW buildings. The longest sit-in was in San Francisco, lasting 28 days. Living with the rudimentary accommodations inside the HEW office building for four weeks, protesters compromised their health to achieve their goals in what came to be known as the 504 sit-in. This sit-in was the longest non-violent occupation of a federal building in U.S. history. The disability community mobilized a successful campaign using a variety of strategies. A lawsuit was filed, hearings before Congress were organized, testimony was delivered to congressional committees, Negotiations were held and letters were written, and on May 4, 1977, the Section 504 regulations were issued after Secretary Califano gave in to the immense pressure. These were the regulations that formed the basis of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The first version of the act was introduced by Senator Weicker and Representative Colo in the 100th Congress in 1988. As a result of across-the-aisle support, the votes in Senate to pass the ADA were overwhelmingly in favor of passage. However, the House of Representatives was not as swift to pass the act. They feared that businesses and firms would need to expend thousands of dollars to meet the compliance standards of the ADA. The big beef that came from the business community was this was going to be incredibly expensive. It was going to make American businesses less competitive worldwide. We had to rebut those as best we could. On March 12, 1990, over 1,000 protesters came to Washington, D.C. to urge the House of Representatives to pass the ADA bill, which had been stalled for several months in what came to be called the Capitol Crawl. To symbolize the barriers burdening disabled people, more than 60 activists abandoned their crutches, wheelchairs, power chairs, and other mobility assistant devices and began crawling up the 83 steps that lead to the Capitol. The Capitol Crawl of 1990 is seen by some present-day disability activists in the United States as a pivotal act for encouraging the ADA into law. That made national news. National news. And uh, it was one of the things that really brought home to senators and congressmen what we were trying to do. The attention and political pressure caused by the Capitol Crawl worked. Within four months, Congress passed the ADA. Then-President George H.W. Bush signed the final version of the bill into law on July 26, 1990. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. From public transportation to TV screens, the ADA's impact is tremendous and widespread. So the ADA is a means, a tool, to allow me and people with disabilities to be able to experience and fulfill those rights, just like you, just like every other able-bodied citizen in the United States. The legislation altered the American landscape by requiring that buildings and transportation be wheelchair accessible and that workplace accommodations be provided for those with disabilities. 
It also prohibited businesses and governments from discriminating against the disabled in job applications and ensured that they received equal pay for equal work. Furthermore, the ADA changed the entertainment industry by requiring closed captioning for television. For the first time in history, disability was defined, thus ensuring deserving people benefited from the ADA. Today, compliance with the ADA remains a topic of discussion in society. While institutions do enough to merely meet the compliance standards of the ADA, people with disabilities and disability advocates say that compliance is not enough. Institutions need to further expand upon the ADA's guidelines to ensure that those living with disabilities feel included and cared for.